Our text today is from the Gospel reading. And Jesus said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Entertainers often speak of a live audience. The best of them have a minor act to warm up the crowd before the main event. They know what they're talking about. The people in the audience are not passive listeners, but they play a part in the program. A boring speaker, a bored audience, has an effect on each other. Every classroom teacher understands this principle. Education is a two-way street. The teacher must have the interest and the cooperation of the student. That's what's wrong with all of this court-ordered counseling today. Oh, you can order them to do it. But you can't make a man listen to something he doesn't want to hear. So says Jesus. There's a connection between the seed and the soil, the speaker and the listener, the preacher and the congregation. That's why you come across this cryptic line again and again in the gospel. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. West of here, where I once served, the churches are small and widely scattered. And it was not unusual to preach two, three, four times on any given Sunday. There was one place I hated to go to. It wasn't that they threw hymnals at the pulpit or walked out in the middle of the sermon. But there was a coldness in that sanctuary. I can't explain, but I can feel the chill of it in my bones to the present day. That's why it's fun to speak at Emmanuel. The people seem to be listening. And if you aren't, you sure got me fooled. But I'm getting ahead of the story. Remember the setting here? The people were flocking to Christ in large numbers, and he began to speak unto them in parables. This bothered the disciples. For one thing, they couldn't understand what the parables meant. For another thing, why speak in parables at all? Why not speak plainly to the crowd? Tell them flat out what's what. Why would you speak in riddles, as it were? Dark, mysterious parables that are open to misinterpretation. No, no, Jesus is saying. Why would you bring a lamp and put it under a bushel basket or under a bed? Wouldn't you put it upon a stand? Well, of course you would. The common lamp of that day wasn't much compared to the fancy candelabra adorning the houses of the wealthy. The ordinary lamp was made of clay, about three inches high, shaped like a bowl, in which was the oil and the wick. And because the lamp was so small, you set it upon a stand or a pedestal to illumine the dark room. And in the soft glow of that little flame, the furniture emerged out of the shadows. You could see the shape. You could see the colors. You could see stuff you never saw before. Now, I can't explain why that happened. But I know that it happened. I would think that the vast night of darkness can overwhelm the 
poor little flame. No. The little light dispelled the vast night of darkness. My parables are like that, Jesus said. They illuminate. They're meant to reveal and not conceal. Parables illustrate the twofold effect that God's word always has. To him who gets it, he gets more. To him who has not, he loses even the little that he had. Parables are like that pillar of fire and of cloud that led Moses and the people out of Egypt. The same pillar that was a light to the slaves of Goshen was a restraining wall of fire to the Egyptian. So, if you receive the little bit of truth, you get more. And if you don't, you won't. You know Lily Tomlin, the comedian? Very funny lady, some great one-liners. The trouble with the rat race, she says, is even if you win, you're still a rat. But she also said something that has more of truth in it than humor. She says, we are born with two ears and one mouth that ought to tell us something. Jesus' point exactly. It is a remarkable fact that Jesus never gave any lessons on speaking. He could have. He was the best there ever was. Even his critics gave him that much. The soldiers sent to arrest Jesus came back empty-handed because never man spake as that man spake. Jesus stresses the hearing. And I'm not, not, not listening to words. I have it on good authority that there is nothing more infuriating than to speak to a husband that ain't listening. Yes, dear. No, dear. That nice dear. And I ain't got a clue what was said. Or if I say to one of the girls, where do you think you're going? And stab, I explained it all to you last week and you said it was okay. I did. And my wife said, over, yeah, yeah, you did. What if you listen to God's word like that? Jesus said, take heed, be careful what you hear. And I don't really hear him. What you're listening to. See, that's the medical problem of the autistic child. It isn't the child can't see, can't hear. It's that the child sees everything and hears everything and therefore can't make sense out of anything. The sense is overwhelmed. The circuits are overloaded so that the child cannot function. Now, you live in the information age. With all kinds of stuff available to you at your fingertips. The email and the, the, the net. You be careful what you hear. There's a lot of information out there you don't need. And a whole heck of a lot of it you shouldn't have. Jesus wrapped up the teaching on parables with a picture of a man reaching into a seed packet and picking out a mustard seed. Now that seed is so small, he's got to use his fingertips to get a hold of just one. And I couldn't even see just one in the palm of my hand without bifocal. But he plants that seed in the damp, dark, moist earth where it decays and decomposes and germinates. And in time, 
boom, you got a tree. And a fat old robin who ate 200 mustard seeds for breakfast now comes and builds her nest in the bow of that tree. That evening, when the clouds were gone and the twelve were alone with Jesus, they asked him to explain this stuff. And Jesus did. He was not disappointed in his friends. He did not fault them for being such slow learners. Jesus is a marvelous teacher and patient, incredibly patient. Never going fast, all Father, and we are able to follow. There is this arresting line in the text. He told them as much as they could understand. Isn't that great? He didn't give them all of the history, all the theology, all the psychology of religion. It would be like looking into a thousand watt bulb. He showed them one little lamp that is shining in the dark. He didn't give them the whole dog door oak tree, they couldn't handle it. Ah, uh, here's a little acorn that you can handle. It's like a four-year-old says, Mama, where do babies come from? Well, now, she could drop on them the whole nine yards about ovulation, copulation, fertilization, gestation, parturition, and all the stammering explanations of the gynecologist. Now, I'm just thinking, in time, in time, where do they decide? They come from God. And by the way, that is the truest thing you're ever going to tell the child. Because all life does come from the author who sorts of life. The, see, the disciples didn't know the whole story yet. How could they? It hadn't happened. They didn't know about Jesus' suffering and death and resurrection. They didn't know how dying produces new life. In fact, when Jesus did tell them, they didn't believe it. At the Last Supper, he said, He that believeth in me, the works that I do, he shall do. And he shall do even greater works. And their jaw fell open. They stared at each other in unbelief. We, you, I, do greater works than Jesus? Ah, oh, people, it's happened. Our church in this corner has ministered to more souls in its history than Jesus ever saw in his whole life. Let me tell you one story. John Wesley, brilliant scholar, graduated from Oxford with honor. And he comes to America, to Georgia, as a missionary, where he completely fails in his personal life and in his professional life. So, he goes back to England, a broken man, burned out, empty, spiritually dead. And one evening, he walks down a street called Aldersgate and turns in at the door of a storefront church where a prayer meeting is in progress. Now, the preacher didn't show up that night. So some guy got up and started to read out of Luther's commentary on the Romans. I can't think of anything in the world more boring than Luther's 
commentary on the Romans, and I know because I read it, which tells you you cannot predict when or where the seed of God's word will fall. Suddenly, Wesley later writes in his journal, suddenly my heart was strangely warmed. And that one warm, glory heart began a movement in England that addressed the social oppression and injustices of the time so that England never had to go through the kind of thing as the French Revolution. Wesley's church to this day has an emblem of a cross, always oh, a cross first and foremost. But the symbol is a cross that is wrapped in a flame. You need more than a correct theology. You need hearts that are burning on fire. And that comes from the imperishable Word of God, the empowering, uplifting, igniting instrument of the Holy Spirit. Don't curse the darkness, my friend. Shine for someone not very far away is looking for your light to walk in, to warm them, to cheer them and make life bright and beautiful for them. Don't worry about the trees, the fruit, the boughs, the shade, the sh Carefully nurture the seed in your own heart. Believe me, you can trust God for the rest. Amen.